directly as co-workers. And good morning. I'm Tasha Davenport, CEO of CASBO. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, with CalSTRS and our own staff. We'll introduce in a moment for uh, our next of the CASBO Summer Speaker Series around uh, contribution rates and policy changes with CalSTRS. Before we jump in, I know many of you know the gig, uh, but just some logistics. We are uh, posting or have posted the PowerPoint in the Q&A. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be put uh, back out on our website, uh, usually by tomorrow that takes place. Uh, we will be housing questions in the Q&A and Sarah will facilitate a Q&A session towards the end of the presentation with our guest. And so just making sure that all that communication is flowing throughout the webinar. Uh, a, a request that I have for all of you that are attending, uh, as we start to look at, you know, Early lessons learned when schools, you know, as schools have opened, uh, we would like to know if you would like to contribute to that conversation with lessons learned. Uh, if you would like to be a panelist on one of our upcoming webinars, you know, where are we now? What do we know? Uh, I'll ask you to send that feedback directly to me so that we can get that scheduled uh, here in short order. Um, and my email will be at the end of the presentation. So just planting that seed. But um, the real reason we're here today is to hear from this wonderful panel of experts, Sarah Baches, our Chief Governmental Relations Officer here on the CASPO staff. Uh, happy to have Sarah. David, thank you for joining us, Deputy Systems Actuary for CalSTRS. Jocelyn, I know you're their Government Relations Director. And also John, a Government Relations Manager. So just a talented team. Uh, we're really you know, interested in hearing your perspective on uh, where we are right now with CalSTRS. Um, and I'm personally curious, you know, as we've had you know, deferrals in, in the budget, we've got this redirect on our CalSTRS. There's a lot of that that was done for business continuity. And as we you know, look forward those those next couple of years and those implications two years out to you know, 20, 22, 23, or 21, 22, 23, um, what can we look for in terms of the implications, you know, maybe even some unintended consequences of some of these changes? Uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you again for joining us. And um, we're, uh, again, pleased to have you here. Thank you. And this is David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be going first. Uh, as the... Uh, Deputy System Actuary at CalSTRS, my job is to basically overview the whole funding of CalSTRS, the, the pension funding, especially the funding plan that was passed by the legislature uh, in 2014. And this year was a very interesting year. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so if you look at the last two years, especially when it comes to the funding of CalSTRS, the, you know, uh, paying down on funded liability, you can kind of see the how the state's budget, both last year and this year, how it played into it. So if we go back to 2019, when the state had a, a substantial surplus, uh, the state decided in 2019 to use uh, some of the surplus to give additional funding to both CalSTRS and CalPERS as well. So for us, we actually received more than over $3 billion in July of 19 that was used to help the state with their CalSTRS contribution and also the employers with their CalSTRS contribution. And this year, uh, with the whole COVID-19 situation, you could tell from the beginning the state was looking for ways to help the employers. And in the end, the decision that was made was to uh, if you want, redirect a uh, money that they gave us last year to provide rate relief to the employers. And I'll show you. But last year, basically, the state sent us uh, $2.2 billion for the employers, uh, of which uh, uh, last year about $600 million was used to lower the employer rate. And the other $1.6 billion was really meant at the time, the intent 
was to provide what we call long-term rate relief. It was to reduce the employer's share of CalSTRS unfunded liability. And at the time, we had estimated that it would, over a 25, 26-year period, uh, uh, reduce the employer rate by about 0.3% of payroll. What the state did now is they basically took, if you want, 26 years of, uh, of future savings and use them to lower the employer rate for two years. It was kind of a trade-off of short-term help in exchange for you know, taking away some long-term savings. So basically, with what the state has done now, you're probably all aware, the employer contribution rate to CalSTRS uh, is going to be about 16% for the next two years. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? And I'll show you visually now what I mean. So uh, just to help kind of you see the whole history of our funding, uh, I've got three lines here for you. So if you look at the blue line first, this is the funding plan that was adopted by the legislature in 2014. So if you recall, uh, at the time when the funding plan was adopted, the plan was to bring the employer rate to 19.1%. And in order to help the employers to have time to prepare for it, these rate increases were purposely phased in over a seven-year period. So that rate was scheduled to actually be 19.1% this year. In the 19th uh, budget, that's what we are, it's the red line here that we say uh, with SB90, that this was the 2019 budget. Uh, the state basically gave us that $2.2 billion of contributions for the employers. And you can kind of see what the state did. It, some of the money was used to lower the employer rate uh, short term. So you can kind of see the difference between the red and the blue. Uh, you know, it lowered the employer rate to about 17.1% for 1920. And it was scheduled to lower it to 184 in 2021 instead of 19.1. And after that, you can see those long-term savings I talked about. You can kind of see the difference between the red and the blue. About 25, 26 years of savings, about 0.3% of payroll. What the state did now with the 20 budget is it basically said, we want to use all of these long-term savings, redirect them, and use them solely to provide short-term savings. So you can see now the employer rate for 2021 is about six, it's just above 16%, 16.15. And right now, it's expected to be a little bit below 16% next year. So what I want you to be aware of so is next year for 21-22 is actually the first year that our board will have the authority to adjust the employer rates. That will be the first time in the history of CalSTRS that actually our board will adopt the employer contribution rate. And the way that the, uh, that the budget uh, trail bill language was written is uh, the language did not take the board rate setting authority for the employer away. It just said that whatever the rate is, the employers will pay about 3% less, 2.95% is what is in the bill. So right now we, we anticipate that we will ask the, the board to adopt an 18.1% contribution rate, which will bring down what the employer pay us to just below 16%. But what I really want you to pay attention here is what is currently scheduled to happen in 22-23. That rate is expected to jump to 18% of payroll. Uh, this is huge because if you look when the funding plan was passed, those rate increases were purposely phased in over a seven-year period to specifically avoid this, to avoid those kind of increases. 2% of payroll increase will be the largest in single-year increase that employers at CalSTR will have ever seen. So that's, uh, that's a big increase. So that's something that everyone will need to be ready for. Right now, we anticipate that the long-term rate is going to stay in the 18% uh, range. But the one big caveat I have for everyone here, I think over the last few years, we've been trying to educate our board members, our stakeholders, the legislature about how our funding plan works. And it's, it's interesting how our funding plan works. If you think about investment volatility, how it impacts contribution rates, that is mostly, uh, it impacts mostly the state contribution rate. The employer contribution rate is not impacted so much by how our investments perform, but what could potentially drive this rate up 
is, and this is what we're a little bit right now in the current environment, if we were to see a decline in the number of teachers in California, either through layoffs or through just not replacing, for example, teachers who are retiring. So what we worry about is keep that in mind that this projection you see here assumes that the number of teachers in California will remain fairly stable. If we start to see a decline, like we have seen in the past uh, in recessions, these numbers could go up. So right now, that's the best projection we have. So the only thing I'll highlight again is what to watch for here is uh, a 2% of a 2% of payroll increase in the contribution rate for employers. So you should be ready to pay about 18% of payroll for the next, uh, starting 22, 23, for the next couple of years after that. So that's on the employer side. Can you go to the next slide, please? So now I was going to talk about the state. I know it doesn't Im impact the employers directly, but you can kind of see uh, what the state was also trying to do to find uh, relief as part of the 20 budget. So when the uh, initial, actually, May revise came out, the state's proposal was to, what we would call, freeze the CalSTR state contribution rate for four years. In the end, uh, the the final budget adopted a, a one-year freeze. So basically, uh, our board last May had adopted an increase to the state contribution rate. So what the legislature did is it it basically froze the rate to the one in effect in 1920. In effect, it it canceled the increase in contribution rate that our board had adopted. But what was clear through the whole 20 uh, through the whole budget uh, cycle, the state was really really wanted to make sure that the CalSTRS funding plan was not impacted long term. So what the state did is it actually used Proposition Two revenues to cover if you want the shortfall created by freezing the rate. We actually already received the money. On July 1st, the state actually sent CalSTRS $297 million of Proposition 2 revenues, of which about $170 million was used to cover that frozen rate, if you want. And then they gave us another $127 million extra to help lower their share of the unfunded liability. So the state still made, if you want, uh, gave us a, a bit of a di additional money to, to make a, a bit faster progress toward full funding. But the one thing that we, uh, we start to worry a little bit in what the state did is, is what we call a catch-up provision. And I'll show you visually. Can you go to the next slide, please? And this is what we're really paying attention to. Again, you can see the same three lines here. Uh, the blue sort of where we were, uh, where we would be, uh, had we not seen any action last year or this year. But this time, I just want you to focus at the red and the green. So uh, what I mean by no catch-up provision, so you can kind of see now by looking at the green, if you compare red and the green on the left-hand side, you can see the freeze that the, that the, that the state did. Now, the, instead of having the, the state rate increasing by half a percent of uh, of payroll, uh, they kept the rate flat for one year. And I've highlighted here with a blue triangle to show you that that difference in that year was made up using Proposition 2 revenues. And what we mean by no catch-up provision is the way the language is written right now, when our board is once again able to adjust the state contribution rate next year, uh, we are limited by the increases we can uh, adopt to half a percent per year. So you can see now we're only going to be able to start from the frozen rate. So what that has created, and the administration is fully aware of this, you can kind of see now that because of this, the state will potentially pay less than they would have had otherwise. You can see the green is below the red. And as a result, the state is going to have to pay more long term. So you can kind of see the actions taken by the state as part of the 2020 budget could potentially result in them having to pay more long term. So the so, so you can kind of see uh, both for the employers and the state. Now, what we're looking at with the actions that were taken, short-term rate relief that was provided to both the employers and the state are now expected to be translated into a higher uh, contribution rate than what was anticipated just six months ago. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, can you go to, the, to my last slide? Next slide, please. So for us, basically, the, 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 the key is we're looking at what the state did. Uh, from a funding perspective, 
it really has no short-term impact to the funding plan. Uh, it, it really what it did is last year in 2019, we got all this extra money from the state. It put us, if you want, ahead of schedule. And a lot of the actions that took place this year sort of uh, took some of the, especially on the employer side, took some of that away. So we're no longer ahead of schedule. We're sort of back to the schedule we would have been under the funding plan. So at least we have no uh, impact on the funding plan short term. But what we're really watching on our side, it's mostly on the state because of that, uh, the fact that uh, now we're going to be able to raise the rate from a, a lower floor rather than a higher floor. What we're a little bit worried about, and we've started to talk to our board, is we're, we're paying attention to the current climate we're in. Like if we've entered a recession, uh, depending how long it lasts, impact potential number of teachers, investment returns, it could, what the state did this year, could have some implications on our long-term funding. So we're going to be keeping an eye on this. And what we worry about is uh, we worry that if the budget situation doesn't improve, it's likely that the state will ask again next year that the state rate be frozen once again. So we'll be keeping an eye on this. Uh, a one-year freeze was not too bad, but if it gets extended beyond one year, it could increase the risk and our ability to reach full funding long-term. So that's so, so far good news. Uh, our, our funding plan still works, no real impact. Uh, but as I showed you, really it was a trade-off of providing short-term savings to employers in the state to help everyone right now at the expense of having to pay a little bit more long-term. And this is it for me. I think, uh, I believe John is next. Thank you, David. Um, hello, everybody. John Meredith Simquick, um, uh, Manager of Governmental Relations. It's nice to be here today. Um, I'm here actually to talk about proposed policy changes. So the first, uh, the, the, the change that I'm going to discuss today has to do with some draft regulations that we are working on here at CalSTRS. Um, in March, the, the CalSTRS board directed staff to, to go forward with forming what we call a drafting team. Um, it, it's the informal part of the administrative, of, of the um, regulations process. So we're beginning the regulations process to make amendments to our regulations concerning um, employer audits and the administrative remedy process that are, are related to um, the results of an employer audit. So the issue is um, initially the, the issue that we, we took to the board was that with our employer audits, and I'm going to get to this in the next slide, but but the issue that we're having is that in our employer audits, once we issue an audit, we issue that audit and it goes to the employer, you, you folks, and then also it goes to the um, sample population, the, the members that we actually go to a, to an employer and we look at those members' accounts and their records. And then we're able to issue an audit to both the employer and the sample population. And in that audit, we provide administrative remedy. Um, we provide a opportunity to request an administrative hearing. But because of the, the employer audit process, we cannot provide that to those members who are also affected by the the audit who are not the sample population. We call that the systemic population. So the board said, yes, please go forth and, and fix this issue. Provide, look for a change to regulations that would also provide um, equal um, administrative uh, remedies for members of the systemic population. So right now we've developed an initial draft of the regulations and we're going and we're talking with all sorts of different stakeholders and we're, we're soliciting feedback from all of them. Our next steps are we would make any additional changes that, that may need to be made based on the feedback we're receiving. Um, and then we would go forth and actually move forward with the formal rulemaking process. We would ask seek approval from the board to draft um, regulations to actually officially notice them through the public comment process, through the Office of Administrative Law, um, there would be a 45-day comment period that that everybody would be able to provide formal comments to us, and then we would have to respond to those comments or make changes, and then there'd be additional comment periods after that, depending on the direction that we go. Next slide, please. 
So the draft regulations that we that we put together, they're intended to accomplish the following goals, as you can see on the slide. And the first one is that we want to provide, as I mentioned, the issue had to do with that we were only providing administrative remedies for the sampled populations. We want to provide equal and consistent treatment um, to the sampled and the systemic populations that are affected by an audit finding. The next thing we wanted to do, and it's kind of the next two bullets, is we really want to speed up the the actual resolution um, of the of the employer audits so that we can so in order to so two things we want to avoid the delays that that may come forth with issuing the final audit report and then and then you know as soon after that audit report is is issued we want to ensure that we can get our corrections in and make the necessary adjustments the benefits so that so that we can um, reduce you know potential overpayments of benefits. And and the amount that we would have to collect back from a member, we can we can reduce that amount as well. Um, and then the final thing is is in order to create some efficiencies for our process and and reduce any any costs to Calsters um, and our fund, we would we're we're aiming to create a, a a method so that we can move all of these um, potential appeals together in one process. So if if there's one audit finding, we would have one one appeal move forward that we would join everybody together in that appeal if people had sought to have a um, to request an appeal an administrative hearing from calsters next slide please so um the the draft regulations would do the following they would make the following changes the first thing that it would do is it would remove the requirement where we inform the sample population of what we call our preliminary or draft audit report. Um, and then also it would it would remove the requirement that we also inform the sample population at the final audit report. And the reason is because at those stages, we don't know who the systemic, who the other members who might be affected by an audit are. And so in order to provide them with the, the same the same rights, the same opportunities, um, we we have to remove we have to remove that requirement, and we're only going to be issuing the the draft audit report and the final audit report to the employer. Um, and then what we would do is we we want to really work on collaborating with the employer on making those corrections after that final audit report. And so it would be establishing a audit resolution period is what we're calling it in which employers would be required to submit the systemic the list of all members affected. so, that would include the systemic population, so all other members affected by an audit finding, and then um, and then also to to provide all of the corrections related to that audit finding after notifying members. So so a key part of this requirement is that employers would be required to notify members prior to making a correction to Calsters, and this is new, um, and we understand it it it. Could get difficult. We've heard feedback about this particular requirement. It could get difficult for um, employers might not always know where where members of former employees. It, it could be could be difficult to locate them. So we've heard that feedback, and we're we're um, trying to kind of consider how to approach that that issue. Um, next slide, please. The goal on that last one, though, just um, is that. We really want to provide the the members a, a heads up before anything is anything takes place that might affect their benefit. So then, um, you know, after at the following that audit resolution period, you know, one of the things that I mentioned in the goals is is trying to make sure that we get our corrections in. And in order to to help with that, um, the regulations, the draft regulations that we put together, create a, a penalty that would begin to accrue if we don't get any list of uh, if we don't get in that list of affected members or we don't get the corrections a penalty would be would be applied that would would then um stop once we get the the, the required um list or corrections so then then after that resolution period the other thing that would occur so assuming we do get all those corrections and and the affected members the list of the affected members we would then be able to issue an, an, a determination letter to both the employer and the members, all members affected, sampled and systemic, where everyone will get the same rights at the same time to request an administrative hearing. 
Um, and so that would be that would be really the, the solution to that main main problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, and then and then finally, recognizing that we will get corrections in after the fact that that may be, you know, even even years down the road, um, because we weren't able to to move those those potential requests along with all of the others in that single process that I mentioned earlier. Um, we would then create a penalty that would recoup our costs if someone did request administrative hearing later on, and they were, uh, you know, they were not able to move be moved forward with uh, the process earlier. Then the cost of that 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 CalSTRS um, would would have um, would be borne by the the penalty in this in this stage. So we would we would apply a penalty that would be roughly equal to an average cost of, of what a one day administrative hearing might cost CalSTRS for, for our staff resources. Um, I did add, there's a, there's a, there's a comparison chart um, in that link that's it's at the bottom and you may, and we can send that to you as well. That's on, it's actually on our website under the employer advisory committee, which some of you may, may sometimes partake in. Um, it's a quarterly committee that we have, and in our committee section on our website, you can find that as well. That's there. So, um, I will pass it on to Joycelyn, who is going to be talking about another potential um, legislative proposal that that we're working on. This regulation would be going, you know, is, is slated to go to the board in November. So we'll, you know, we'll make any changes that we 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 need to make, and then we'll. Put that in front of the board in, in November, hopefully, to see what see what they want to do. If they want to approve us moving forward with that. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. I'm Joycelyn Martinez Wade, Director of Governmental Relations at CalSTRS. And like John said, I wanted to talk about a potential legislative proposal that we're also considering. And given the legislative timeline, we'd also be working on taking this to the board in November. Um, so that we could, if the board wants to move forward, we can find an author and move forward in the 2021 legislative session. So right now, kind of the informal period, like the regulations, but we are working on gathering feedback. And so I want, this is part of our process and I wanted to present the changes. This is related to the statute of limitations, which actually kind of connects into the appeals regulations process, because if there is discovered um, through an audit, or it could be through other means, but that a member has been overpaid. So their benefits, this is someone in retiree status, they've been receiving their benefit and because of how something was reported, they're being overpaid and then we need to change that We change their benefit and we collect back the overpayment. And the current process is that if it is considered employer error and we begin the collections within a certain period of time in that statute of limitations, we collect the entire amount from the employee and then if it's CalSTRS error, so there are times we go back through our system and there's been something we need to correct as a, a systemic, I shouldn't use that word because we use that for the systemic population, but if there's an issue within our administrative system for the pensions, then we need to correct that. We collect back three years, the most recent three years of overpayments from the member, but the balance is written off. And that's kind of how we handle it in those two instances. There is also a possibility of member error or member fraud, and for those we collect, uh, again, if we start the collection within three years of discovering that error or fraud, we collect back the entire amount from the member. So again, it's the member that the bulk of the money is being collected from. So as you can see on the slide, you know, among other things, it changes the collections in the case of employer error. So we would um, acquire collection from the employers under those two instances, or if those two bottom bullets are what is occurring. So the overpayment has occurred for more than three years and it's an employer error. So again, different from today, because if it's employer error and we start collection within three years, we collect the entire amount from the member. This would change it to be that if it's employer error, we collect the most recent three years from the, from the member and the balance from the employer. So go to the next slide. So 
this um, provides equity for members that are experiencing a decrease at no fault of their own. So again, the members didn't have, it's not their error and they're not committing fraud. And I have to say fraud is very, very rare, but um, just neither of those cases. So the member's not involved in the error. We want to have equitable treatment of the members in, in whether it's CalSTRS error or employer errors. So we are looking at matching up the employer error side to the CalSTRS error side, which also coincides with how CalPERS treats these situations. So basically in all situations where it is not member error, the most recent three years of the overpayment is collected from the member. And then depending on who committed the error, the balance is either written off if it's CalSTRS, so essentially CalSTRS is paying for the balance, or if it's employer error, the employer would be paying for that balance. And I'd like to mention that we are receiving feedback already of some of the appeals regulations. We've talked about this with several groups. And so I think we understand that there's potential liability here for the employer if it's employer error that would be added on. And so we've heard that from various groups. And then also on the member representative side, they feel very strongly that the member was not involved. They didn't know what was happening. And they have a question about whether or not they should be paying back any of the overpayment. And so I think we see a balance of some of it being returned from the member um, since that wasn't the benefit they were meant to receive. But we have heard that. And again, we're, we're working on how to approach those concerns that have been raised. And I think that might be my last slide, but if we flip to the next one and make sure. That's and it. Never... Thank you. Yeah. And at this point, we ask folks that if they have questions, you're more than welcome to raise your hand. There's a hand feature and you could ask the question yourself or, um, or input it into the Q&A. So we do have a question, and I think this is for John, just to confirm the proposed regulations on the audit findings would require the employer to notify former employees of the possible impact to their STRS benefits. It would, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, it, so the, the requirement would be that they notify the member of the correction right now is how we have it, have it framed. So um, I don't think that it's possible for the employers to, to be able to, to notify the members of what the impact to the, to the retirement benefit would be. So, so it would be, it would be for them to be able to, to notify the members of what they are going to be doing to correct the, to make the correction that is, that is requested for by CalSTRS. And then on that line, uh, when, if this uh, draft regulations is going before the board in November, what's the plan to put it into effect? What time frame would it start um, to be effective? So the, the, um, we would be noticing, so we'd be requesting the board to notice the, the regulations and so to uh, start the official rulemaking process. After that, we have a full year that the clock starts running that we have to complete that process. So we'll have to go back to the board ultimately for their approval. Um, and then we would, the effective date would be after it would, I think it's actually like on the quarter and, and I, so it wouldn't probably be effective. I'm assuming Joyce and can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it just depends on the frame, the, the time frames and how fast those processes occur, but we would probably be looking not until the um, beginning of the 2021 school year. That would be the, on the optimistic side to, to um, the end of that school year, I assume on the, on, you know, the, for a slower, slower time frame. Choice then, did you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, it's a hard to say exactly. So I think what John described is correct. It uh, depends on how many comments we receive during any uh, during the first comment period, how uh, comprehensive the changes are, and also kind of the board calendar because each time we do get comments and we either and we respond to those and, and make changes or don't depending on what the comments are, we need to go back to the board to confirm that they are okay with the path we're taking and then potentially we go out for a an additional comment period of 15 to 45 days. Then we kind of have to cycle back in with the board calendar. So um, I think it could almost be a year you know, that we it would take. So to the end of 2021, the calendar year, I would think at least it would take that long. And then Jocelyn, on your potential legislation, what are precautionary measures or um, things that we can start implementing now as employers to reduce this employer rate to start figuring out systems that we should be putting in place so that we don't catch ourselves in these situations. 
I think that's a great question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think our empl- uh, member account services, which are, is our employer services branch, does provide training. And so I think that's key. And they are actually really ramping up because, as you know, we're implementing a, a new pension administration system. Um, and you're familiar with the new file format regulations that we went through previously. There have been a lot of readiness meetings with our direct report sources trying to get prepared for the new system, which wouldn't go into effect any earlier than October 2021. Um, so we're looking at about a year out from now, but there's trainings associated with that and kind of accessing the new system. So I would encourage people to take advantage of those trainings and also to reach out if you have new staff, because you know that can happen, new staff. Um, staff that need a refresher, there are training courses available through member account services. So you can always request those when there has been an audit. I know our member account services offers training on those specific issues that may have been findings in an audit. Of course, that's sort of after the fact. So I really encourage folks to, to connect with their employer services rep and try to set up time ahead of schedule and you know maybe even mention that this is something you understand that these audits happen or that errors are found and that you really want to try to avoid them and then maybe they can tailor the training to even new staff or veteran staff. What's creating, is there something that we're noticing that's creating the discrepancies that we're seeing in the reporting so that once we get to this place, clearly the audits take place after a member has retired, um, but are there any aha moments of where we've recognized, are we just counting the wrong service credits? Are we not calculating that information properly on the front end? Or is it because employees tend you know, migrate and move out of different um, employer systems? And so wondering if there's any aha moments that, that CalSTRS has recognized where these errors keep popping up. Yeah, I think that's a really good question too. Um, the three most common audit findings, and of course there's there's different flavors within those three most common audit findings, but I'll start with the ones that I think are kind of, are, are a little less applicable, but uh, do come up in audits, but post-retirement earnings. But since it's post-retirement, it, um, it doesn't directly affect the benefit unless something hasn't been reported, of course, and then the person's gonna be paying back any uh, anything over the earnings limit. But again, the, that doesn't mean the benefits been calculated incorrectly or there was a, a factor that was incorrect in the calculation. That means they should have been working under the limit. The um, Any pay they were receiving should have been reported to CalSTRS. And so now they may have to pay something back. But again, the benefit isn't necessarily wrong. Um, another thing is sick leave and the difference between basic and excess sick leave. And so actually AB 2101 is a bill that had our housekeeping provisions put into it this year, has made it to the governor's desk. Um, We're very much hoping that he'll sign it, but it provides clarification that I hope a lot of you are aware of that got a little confusing there, but 12 basic sick leave days, anything above 12 is considered excess at the end of a member's career when sick leave is reported and can be converted to service credit, excess sick leave must be paid for by the last employer. And that sometimes is not tracked or maybe reported incorrectly. And so, again, it's more about who pays for it because the basic is paid for in part by the 0.25% contribution rate that employers pay. And it, it, what happens is, is that if excess and basic are reported together, the member gets the right amount of service credit that it's converted to, but how it's paid for. So we may need to come back to the employer and ask them to pay for any excess sick leave that wasn't categorized correctly. So I think the one other common out of finding that would probably be where I would say to focus is reporting of compensation as either, you know, whether it goes straight to DBS, when it goes to DB, how is it characterized when it goes to DB? Is it part of salary? Is it remuneration in addition to salary? I think a common term is special compensation. Is it more than a, is it a one-time payment or a limited term payment? Those are the ones that most directly go to the defined benefit supplement program. So that's where I would say that, that um, the focus is would be on because I think that can be a kind of a complex decision tree. I think the new file format with the additional detail that it includes is meant to help with employers figuring out which bucket it goes in and how to report it. So that's another piece in that training I think can connect nicely with that. 
And what we could do is um, include on part of our uh, web page the training link so that folks have that readily available when all of this material comes forth. We'll make a note of that. Turning to David, something that you mentioned in terms of um, our, the impacts, potential layoffs, replacement of active and members. And I remember a few months ago, which now seems like a lifetime, um, that th the number of active members, how critical that is to the sustainability of the three prong approach, how the state, the employer, employees pay into a system. Um, what is it that really is keeping CalSTRS up thinking um, that, that needs to be really solid in order to continue with the 2024 plan of solvency? Um, what are things that we should be aware of as um, there's hiring decisions being made? Um, are there any other factors that we should be cognizant that, that are having having that you're having discussions with the state, with the governor's office, the legislature of this all? will tie into the solvency of the program, making sure that we meet that goal that was part of the reform changes that were made a few years ago. That's a long question. I'll try to address as much as I can. Uh, first, uh, when it comes to you know monitoring the funding plan, making sure it still works as intended, uh, we do that on a we continuously monitor the plan and we formally report to our board uh, twice a year, once in the spring when we do what we call our annual evaluation, and once in the fall when we do what we call our risk report, where we look at risks that could impact the funding plan. So we, we were, right now, the answer is still we are on track to reach full funding. Uh, that's why we are monitoring. If we start to see things we don't like that could impact our ability to reach full funding, we will make the whole world know. But right now, we are still on track. Uh, we are, uh, I would say, monitoring what we call the number of teachers in California. And the reason, as employer, here's what I want you to be aware is, so we have this unfunded liability today that we're trying to pay off. You can view it as a mortgage. We have a a, a set amount of unfunded liability. The employers are responsible for about two thirds of it, the state about one third. And we're trying to collect dollar amounts to pay it off. And our mechanism to collect the money is actually right now a percentage of payroll. We're not billing the employers for a dollar amount. We're collecting it through uh, contributions of percentage of payroll. If the payroll starts to decrease because we have less teachers, we still need to make the same mortgage payment. So now that mortgage payment, if you want, becomes a higher percentage of a, a payroll that's lower. So just something to keep in mind that even if you if you if you are forced to cut positions as a result of budget pressure, just keep in mind that your CalSTRS con contributions may not go down as much as you thought because our board may be. Uh, in the need to raise the contribution rate in order to ensure we still reach full funding. Because if you, if you remember the way the funding plan was designed, starting next year, our board will be able uh, every year to, our board will reassess the funding every spring. And then based on a recommendation made by us, may uh, increase the employer contribution rate. And right now, based on the parameters set in statute, our board can only either increase or decrease by no more than 1% of payroll. And we can never increase it to a level uh, in excess of 20.25%. So right now, if we were to see uh, a big decline in number of teachers over the next few years, it's, potential, it's, it's quite likely that our board will have to raise the rate. It, it could go up to 19, 20, but in any event, it will never go more than 20.25%. So we'll keep monitoring this. At this point, we're still telling employers expect to see a rate around 18%, but we will, it, it's hard to tell. We're going to keep an eye on it. And in, in fact, uh, we just uh, recently, uh, last week, got the, uh, our, uh, the information as of June, uh, June 30th, 2020, and already we've started to see a slight decline in a number of teachers i don't think we're i don't think we have seen layoffs but uh, it could just be from uh, teachers retirings and employers electing not to replace those positions in order to save money but we've already seen a slight decrease i think we lost about 3000 active teachers we went from about 451000 to 448 it's it's not large enough to make an impact
Uh, just to, to put it in perspective, when the Great Recession hit in 08 or 09, we went from, over the course of three years, we went from having 460,000 teachers in California, uh, actively members of Cal Calsters, down to 400,000. So if we were to see any kind of significant decreases like this, uh, it will impact the employer contribution rate. So that's what we're going to be watching for. Sorry for the long answer. I appreciate it. It's, um, and I it temporarily had a lapse that I uh, forgot. It's a different system about how we do it with stirs and purrs. Um, uh, but we have a question, and you briefly mentioned about can CalSTRS now set employer rates, not through no longer being set through legislation. So you did mention that stirs board can now make the changes. And when did that? What what year will that take effect that they can begin making those changes? Twenty one twenty two. So basically, uh, we will. Uh, in May of next year is when the board will will set it. Our plan is uh, we will always try to give employers at least a close to one year heads up as to where it might be. So we know that next year because we already, so when we set the rate next year, it's going to be based on what we call the June 30th, 2020 information. So we know that information now. So we're quite confident that next year we'll recommend a rate around 18.1%. So, uh, so in the future, it's going to be tricky because we'll be able to provide the employers an estimate in the fall, but we will not know the exact rate for the July 1st until May. So you can kind of see it will be a short turnaround. So we'll make sure that at least a year before when employers prepare their budget that uh, uh, everyone kind of get, can get an idea of where it's going to be roughly. You know, we may say something, the rate is 18, going to be 18.1. It may end up being 18.15 or 18.05. We'll try to estimate it to the best we could, but we will not know until we actually do the work and our board adopts it. But basically, May of 21 is the date to watch for. That will be the first time ever our board will set the employer rate. And it should be done every May after that, through the end of the funding plan, through 2046. Another question we got is, if the excess day is not used in the prior year, does the excess day uh, get used in the current year, similar to FIFO? I'm not familiar with FIFO, but um, so in response to the sick leave days, the basic and excess, uh, basic sick leave days are required to be first in, first out. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, basic sick leave days are required to be used first. So I don't know, so I don't think it's first in, first out. So basic sick leave days, if you keep accumulating those and excess on top of that, basic sick leave days need to be spent down first, if you will. And then excess sick leave days are left after that. So if someone uses all their basic sick leave days through their career at the end and there's only excess left, then that's what the employer pays for. Um, I think usually there's a balance of both, but in the case of someone actually receiving excess sick leave days, but yeah, basic has to be used first. And can a district uh, report directly to CalSTRS? If so, can we get additional information? It's a good question. There are regulations for districts to be able to report directly to CalSTRS. So there's several steps that have to be taken, several criteria to be met. And so I don't know all of that off the top of my head, but you can find it in our regs, but we can get a link and see if there's any um, other helpful documents that Member Account Services has put together on that process. And we'll make sure to provide all of that at the same time when we um, put up the link for the webinar. I don't see any other questions and I'll follow Tasha's rules of giving eight seconds. Um, just time to see if, uh, if there's any additional information uh, that people have questions. Uh, I hope this didn't feel like a grilling session. I really have learned a lot from you and I always appreciate all the hard work and working very collaboratively with every one of you. Um, I'm trying to buy time for those eight seconds. Uh, and I really know that you guys work really hard and have been very collaborative in, in listening to feedback from the employer. So we can we look forward to always continuing to have that partnership with every one of you. Uh, and with that, I still don't see any questions. So I'll go ahead and let folks know that we have a research page that we update with um, updated links and, and any information that has recently come about and that here's our contact information. If you have any additional questions, 
We got to thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank Sarah. You. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say to just say thank you and to all to everybody who, who came today and also just um, I know you just you, you shared your contact information and, and mentioned additional questions. We are really, you know, we this is soliciting feedback from Joyce Lynn and me for especially for these potential policy changes. So we, we would really appreciate any any feedback. And, and so you can send it through Sarah. Um, our contact information is, is available as well. And um, we just look forward to, to hearing from anybody who has any feedback. So thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you to our audience. We'll look forward to talking with you next week. Have a great one.